Hi everyone, I have strapped up my bones, I have donned my Miss Honey wig and I'm here today to talk to you about all of the books that I read in April. Some of them I haven't finished and I'm carrying over into this month, May, which is always the case with reading. Don't reach the end of the month and have suddenly finished everything that I was reading. But it's a bit more than usual and I think that's indicative of how itty bitty my reading was in April. My attention span was split. I wanted to jump between lots of different titles and some of that was due to it being Disability Readathon, wanting to read as many books as possible during that month for that readathon but also as a disabled person reading disabled literature it's quite heavy so <laughs> it was a lot of balancing going on but I read some really great books, some not so great books. Let's talk about them. So firstly, let's get out of the way the ones that I'm carrying over into next month, which are The House Opposite by Barbara Noble, which I spoke about in a reading vlog, which I'll link down below. And I also spoke about Schizophrene by Barnard Capil in that reading vlog. That's a vlog where I'm reading books by authors whose work I've loved before, but I've only ever read one of their books before. So it's seeing if they're new favorites or if they were one hit wonders. So I talk about them a bit in that video. I'll speak about them nor, nor, more, the end of May, once I finish reading them. I'm also in the middle of reading Not This, which is Al McNichol's book, which is wonderful and you should all read it. But this is a placeholder to remind me to talk about an audiobook that I'm halfway through, which is by Sarah Hillary and it's called Someone Else's Skin. I think, yes, Someone Else's Skin. So this is a new crime book that I'm reading, always on my hunt for finding great female-led crime. Enjoying it so far, it is quite violent. I'll talk about that more at the end of May. And then finally, I think this is the last one I'm carrying over. This is Growing Up Disabled in Australia, and this is edited by Carly Finley. This is definitely gonna be one of my favorite books of the year. I mean, I say that and I'm only 80 pages in. It's gonna have to do something pretty darn terrible to not make it onto my favorites list. Like with Disability Visibility by Alice Wong, this is just such an amazing book and I would urge everybody to pick it up. Shall I read you a quote? Let me find you a bit that I've underlined. Okay, this is a bit from Elle Gibbs' essay who says, the social model of disability gave me a framework for understanding my chronic illness, but it sometimes had little room for actual experience of being sick. I had to find a way to reconcile my knowledge that disability was about structural barriers within the reality of my impairments. Was there space for both disability pride and finding my disabled body literally hard to bear? Sometimes it was my impairments that stopped me from accessing the world, not just the obstacles in that world. I could engage in political action and break down external barriers all I liked, but my skin was still raw and bleeding and I was still in pain and exhausted. Did this mean that the medical model was right, that I had to focus on finding a cure? What did it mean if I decided not to try and do any more treatments? What would happen when there were no more treatments to try? What if I wanted the pain to stop? Would this mean I was a failure as a disabled person? These are so many varied essays talking about disfigurement and disability, looking at medical models and social models of disability and so many different voices and I can't praise it enough. I'll talk about it more at the, at the end of May. All right, onto the books that I did finish reading. One of the first books that I read in April was Michael Rosen's new book. This is Many Different Kinds of Love, a story of life, death, and the NHS. Obviously very topical. You could see this being rolled out as a, like, isn't our NHS so great? Read this book, everyone's a hero, all of that stuff. It could be really easy to make this cheesy and dress it up in something a bit, grotesque and if you're not familiar with Michael Rosen and you're worried that this might be one of those kinds of books please note that it's not one of those kind of books and I always love Mick for the kind of writing that he does where he tries to tear down barriers on difficult topics open up discussion to further political discussion as well I think that he's brilliant so Mick contracted Covid in March last year went into hospital, was on a ventilator, was in ICU. They didn't think that he was going to make it at many different points. Um, so this is him writing about that. And it's got poetry in here. It has notes from the people who were looking after him in ICU, which I thought was one of the, the most moving parts of this book because there were lots of volunteers who went into hospitals 
when they were completely overflowing and would sit by patients beds when doctors and nurses were so stretched that obviously they couldn't do that and every day they would write down you know make this is what we did today this is what i talked to you about when you were asleep in your coma so he has this amazing diary of 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 people helping him and it makes me want to cry talking about it it's it's so lovely that is so lovely um and he's also talking about government response to covid he covers lots of different things in this book and i think it would have such wide appeal and if it's something that you feel like you could read i would really recommend it i loved it Thirdly, a book that I did not enjoy was this one, which is Chattering by Louise Stern. This is a short story collection. Louise is deaf and all of the main characters in this book are also deaf. And the first sentence on the back says, from Rio to Los Angeles, Louise Stern's characters, restless young men and women, offer us a perspective on our world, which is piercingly insightful and startlingly new. Unfortunately, I didn't find it insightful or new. I found this book quite boring. I found, the characters blended together. Most of them were very dismissive of other disabilities and disfigurements too, which was quite jarring in this book. Sure, maybe have some dislikable characters who have opinions like that, but it all kind of blended together. Um, yeah, and I was reading reviews afterwards by especially deaf reviewers saying that they felt it lacked vibrancy, didn't really explore deaf culture. It really didn't stick with me. I would finish a story and I would already be forgetting the one that I'd read before. And that's not what you want from a short story collection. Something I will say though, that I am finding incredibly frustrating is the marketing of books like this. So let's forget about the content for a second. Like on the back, it says, um, how to be heard when you cannot speak, how to speak when you cannot hear other women's stories, replays through Stern stories, and that's a quote from the Financial Times. How to be heard when you cannot speak. Like, I'm moving on to El Defo, quote on the back, which I have quoted before when I hauled it because it annoyed me so much. Even with a hearing aid turned off, you can hear Cece's universal plea for acceptance, friendship and happiness. Even if you're deaf, you can hear what she's saying. It's different methods of communicating and often hearing people will not fulfill that gap. They will not come closer in order to communicate. It's not a lack of speaking. It's not a lack of communicating on behalf of the deaf community. It is society's ableism. And I'm really not here for the puns talking about how deaf people can't speak, or you know, even if you're deaf, you can hear that Cece wants to be accepted. It's really, it gets under my skin, which I'm sure you can tell by my body language right now. We really need more uh, more own voices reviewing and blurbing. It's just a little bit embarrassing. So despite the quote on the back here, which really annoys me, this book by Cece Bell is brilliant. I love it. This is a graphic memoir called El Defo. This is Cece's experience of getting a phonic ear, which can allow her to hear at school. I often have to wear those if I go into schools myself, um, where a teacher will wear uh, um, a device that connects with the hearing aid of a child who is deaf in a classroom. So she doesn't like wearing it at first because obviously it singles her out in the classroom and no one likes to be singled out in the classroom. But then she's just loving that superpower and how quite amusingly and something that I think kids everywhere would love is that she can hear that teacher wherever that teacher is in the school. I mean, crossing some boundaries, right? She even can hear her go to the bathroom because the teacher forgets to turn off this device. But she has great experiments with her friends where they will wear it and they'll go far away and she'll see how far she can hear them, how far away can they walk. Um, so I really enjoyed that very, very much. And she really delves into kids' acceptance or not acceptance of differences and how she reacted to that and her inner monologue as well. I thought this was great. I would highly recommend it. Ignore the quote on the back. It's brilliant. I read, not this book, because this is a book that I read in March, I read the second book in the Claire McGowan, uh, Paul and Maguire mystery series, which was called The Dead Ground. And I felt the same way that I felt about reading The Lost in that 
I felt as though it promised more than it delivered at the end. I got really swept up in the crime story that was being told, also her relationship with the people that she was working with and her family. But then the ending wasn't quite satisfying, but it left me on a cliffhanger, the first one. I thought, well, I really do want to read the second one, even though the cliffhanger in the first book was very over the top and I didn't, you know, it still drew me in. I still fell for it. I knew what it was doing. I knew that it was dangling bait for me and I still, I still bit, I still bought the next one and I listened to it and it did exactly the same thing. It had this momentum, intrigue, ending not very satisfying, but there was a cliffhanger and I felt that urge to think, well, I should just dive into the third book, but actually it's just not very satisfying. So I'm going to leave it for a bit. And if the bait is still dangling and I'm still tempted by it, then I will dive into the third one. But I'm not sure that this series as a whole is, um, it's definitely not gonna be a favorite of mine anyway. A thriller that I did really enjoy though is by <laughs> Nikki French, Broken Record, but this is a new book. This is not me just rereading the Frida Klein series. It's a, it's a new backlist book for me by Nikki French. This is a standalone called Beneath the Skin. And this is about three women. The first woman is called Zoe, then we've got Jennifer, and then we've got Nadia. And each of them are being stalked by a man who is sending them threatening letters. And they react in very different ways to these letters. And I think it would be very easy for a book like this to fall into that crime trap of really focusing on male violence against women and reveling in that in a way that is just really uncomfortable. I think there is a fine line between discussing the realities of male violence against women and then selling things off the back of that, which is kind of gross. But this book, I think, really gets much deeper than that. And it isn't just looking at the relationships that these women have with this man who is sending them letters, but with all of the men in their lives and how these men react or do not react to the threat of violence that they are experiencing from this outsider, how these men in their lives will normalize that threat or downplay it. It's really examining patriarchy. It is um, pulling down and looking at the structures that allow violence like this to be normalized. And I think that that makes it really wonderful. And I would highly, highly recommend this book. And it is a standalone, which means that, you know, you don't have to get invested in a whole new series of books, one off. And then if you do enjoy it, you can go read the Frida Klein series by Nikki French. Man, I should be sponsored for that. Okay, the next book that I read is this. This is a proof copy. The final version looks like this. This is by Abby Palmer and is called Sanatorium. Abby goes to Budapest to take water therapy there. Um, and I have been to the baths in Budapest, which is so amazing. Like the structure of them is incredible. It's a fascinating um, place to go, but she's going there specifically because of disability and chronic pain. And I think that it really mirrors discussion around women's bodies in Victorian times and hydrotherapy and um, taking the waters that cure women of hysteria and looking at how women experiencing pain can be deemed hysterical. Um, she also talks about outer body experiences within water and the things that she sees, um, which I think brilliantly pairs with another book that I read last month, which is Gargoyles by Harriet Mercer. I'll read you a quote, it says, it must be around this time that I purchased the white cotton Victorian nightgown. In my out of body memory, I am always wearing it. It is a perfect thing, so starched and white and floor length. It hangs in folds. Even without a person in it, it floats. It has everything to do with floating. She's discussing her own body, queerness. She's talking about instances of disability and illness that not only she has embodied in her body, but also experienced through other people. We moved into a house that is full of ghosts. It had belonged to a family friend, Fleur. She was a laughter therapist. She had been diagnosed with throat cancer after years of the doctor dismissing her symptoms on the ground that she simply laughed too much. A proud member of the New Age movement, Fleur was obsessed with the healing benefits of blueberries and green tea. I had felt her haunting me even before she died. The whole book feels very fluid, both in its form and also in its structure. And I think that a lot of disabled and chronically ill people will see themselves in this book. Everyone at the party kept saying, you look really well, but I'm limping quite heavily. That's a hard thing to explain. Walking is a sign of how well you're doing and being able to walk means, oh yeah, you're coping. Not being able to walk means, no, 
you're not coping. There's no space for a gray area of, wow, you've made significant improvements, but they're very internal. I can sit up straighter and feel less pain, but I still can't walk very well. That's a hard thing to explain to people. I think if you like Maggie Nelson, and if you ended up picking up Lauren Eggert Crow's The Exhibit, which is one of my favorite poetry collections, I'll link it down below, then I think you will really love this. There's something museum-like about the way that she writes about it. It's as though she is walking through a museum and examining different parts of her body that are on display. And that examining is really crucial to zooming outwards and then looking at how the wider world, people outside of our own bodies also examine our bodies. So there is this double gaze going on, which I think is really powerful. And similarly in Gargoyles, Harriet in here is writing about a near-death experience that she had when she was just over 40, I think it was six weeks after her 40th birthday and she collapsed at home. And so frustrating reading the paramedics coming out to her because they thought she was drunk and her mum kept saying could you go and get a stretcher for her please because she can't walk and they said well we don't have a stretcher but we do have we do have a sheet that we carry dead bodies in would that work like so unbelievably patronizing and then when she gets to the hospital they're still being very dismissive of her until they realize that she has a huge tumor on her kidney a 30 centimeter tumor on her kidney at which point they start being a bit nicer harriet's book is split into different sections so firstly you will get a memoir section when she's talking about being admitted to hospital and then the memoir sec sections throughout are her being in hospital and trying to become well enough to leave and in between those chapters there are more academic discussions where she'll do a deep dive into one thing that she mentioned in the memoir section beforehand. So for instance, in the first chapter, when she's admitted to hospital, people keep asking her what her pain level is on a scale and she finds that hard to place and then continually hard to place the longer that she's in pain and the longer that she's in hospital because long-term pain people get really frustrated by. I don't mean just the people experiencing it, hello, but trying to explain it to doctors, if it's not immediately fixable, it's very boring very quickly. And also if you're discussing it with other people just in general, it's just not something that I think is easy to conceptualize if you're not the person experiencing it. Um, so in the chapter after the first one, she does deep dive into pain scales and talking about pain and she references other texts. And I really love that structure. And that was something that was added later, actually. I did an event with Harriet last month and um, which I'll link in the description box down below because it's on YouTube, you can watch it. And we talked about the structure and she said she had just written it as memoir, mostly all the way through and then it went even further afterwards um i don't want to spoil the end it seems weird talking about spoiling a memoir but there's a particular section at the end in this book that is referenced briefly in the last chapter but that was a whole half of the book um and then her editor said actually i would like you to cut that and i would like you to maybe thinking think about putting in these essays in between um and i would love to read the bit that was cut as well but i do think that this, this new structure is is pretty wonderful and she's talking about what it's like to be an ill person, being a tourist in the realm of disability and chronic illness, as she calls it. She says, when you are first able to gather your bearings in illness, it feels indeed as if you have been parachuted into an alien country without the necessary currency in your pocket or the language to help you integrate into its culture. The memoir sections of this book reminded me of Josie George's A Still Life. So if you like that book, I think you will also like this one too. But um, if you wanna hear more and more thoughts that I have and things that Harriet would like to share, then go over and watch the event that I did with her last month. I have a reading vlog forthcoming where I am talking about and reading different journals because I'm asked quite a lot what poetry journals or just journals in general would I recommend reading and I think I've become quite stagnant in my journal reading. I always read the Rialto and Poetry London and it had been a while since I was looking for other journals to read and I've come across a few such as Ache, Sick and Cunning Folk recently which I've spoken about um, but it was really fun to then go out and research other journals I might want to read so I have a reading vlog of that coming soon and one of the magazine's journals that I read in that is Sick Volume 2. This is a magazine that's put together um, by chronically ill and disabled people. I thought that it was fantastic and one of the authors in this book 
had a pamphlet which I spoke about in a reading vlog last month too, which is Tracked. Um, this is by Jane Hartshorn. So this was wonderful for discovering new disabled voices that I hadn't come across before, as well as it just being a wonderful journal for me to read. So there's art, there is fiction, non-fiction in here. Um, and I have some work forthcoming in the new issue of Sick. I'm not sure when that's coming out, issue three, but at some point in the future. But yeah, this is fantastic. I'll speak about it more in that reading vlog where I am reading lots of journals. In another reading vlog last month, the one where I was reading authors who I'd read once before and loved to see if I loved more work by them, I started reading this, which is Certain American States by Catherine Lacey, I forgot there for a second. She wrote Pew, which was one of my favorite books of last year. And in that reading vlog, I read the first two stories in this book. The first story is one of the best short stories I've ever read in my life. I worship it. I bow down in front of that story. It's incredible. Um, it is very meta. It has lots of intertextual stuff in there. I just think it's hilarious and also deeply moving and it is available to read online. So I'll link it in the description box down below. But the rest of this book really didn't do anything for me. It was, it was such a shame. I was built up so much by this first story and then I just felt myself deflating throughout the rest of the book. I don't really have anything to say about it apart from it just, it wasn't for me and that's a shame. Finally, I read two picture books last month. The first one is My Wonderline by Vicky Gooden. It's illustrated by Angela Mayers. This is actually a self-published book and I don't normally accept self-published books for review, um, but there are not many books out there to do with chronic illness, disability, disfigurement, scars, especially in children's literature. So when I was contacted, I said, yes, please. Also the illustrations look beautiful. I will say as a caveat, I think that unfair expectations are put on books like this to represent everyone. Um, disability is not a monolith and I don't think this is a representation of disability either and it's not setting out to do that. Um, let me explain, this is very niche. So it says on the back, my wonderline represents children who have been through surgery that has left them with scars and explores that underneath them just maybe there's magic locked within. So Vicky wrote this because her daughter underwent heart surgery and has a wonderline, a scar that goes down her body. So it really is specific to that kind of scar or a scar that you may have got through injury. There's a character in here who has a scar on their forehead and um, because something had fallen on his head. So he had a scar there. It is not about disability. It is not about disfigurement. So I have scars myself, but I don't think I would have seen myself in this book as a child because I also have disfigurements and a disability. But if you do know of a child who does have a scar from surgery such as this, and I think that they will really enjoy seeing themselves in it. I did feel as though the text itself could have been edited. There was quite a few forced rhymes in here, but overall, I think it is a lovely book and it definitely does what it sets out to do. Finally, I read Grandad's Camper, illustrated and written by Harry Woodgate. This was sent to me by Anderson Press for a review. This is the most lovely queer story for kids. So this is about a young girl who goes to visit her granddad and her granddad is talking about Gramps, his partner who passed away recently, who obviously his granddaughter knew and loved as well. And he talks to her about all of the adventures that they used to go on together in their camper van when they were younger. And it's just this sharing of love. And I haven't really read a queer book for kids like that before. Uh, I've read it about parents, but not about grandparents. And I just thought that this was delightful. So those are all the books that I read in April. April, that is correct, April. I will list them in the description box down below. I would love to know what books you read last month. What was your favorite? What was maybe not your favorite? What are you planning to read soon? Tell me anything you like that's to do with books in the comments section. And I hope you're having a great start to the week. I will speak to you very soon. Lots of love, bye.